Good morning to you. Here we are to one of the last paintings in this little series. We're now at the end of the holiday, we've had a week here up at Apple Tree Wick, up in the Dales again, Rosedale, wonderful here. And what I've been doing on this particular trip is to experiment and explore what can be done with these SAA pastels, the Society of All Artists. The SAA very kindly listened to me in the fact that I requested the possibility of some darker colours because I thought the rain was a bit too light. They sent me uh, two, a deep purple and a deep green. The deep purple is great, the green could be a bit darker still. I'll just show you them here. Here are the two test colours they've sent me. For me the purple's about right, quite acceptable. The green though is a bit grey, a bit pale, and although very useful I would prefer a much darker one. It's also important for me to have a very deep blue and a very warm dark black. And you see that when they're compared to some of the darker pastels that I use, I can still do with a bit more depth yet. I'm still hoping for a deep blue from them. But here's the deep blue that I need. So, but now let's show you uh, what happens when we actually use them and how I need those darks in my pictures. And even now I could do with some slightly darker ones still. So let's hope that happens in the future. In the meantime, here I am using them with, with water and brush to get started on a 140 pound hot press artist paper. Rather a nice paper to work on. It's a smooth surface paper, being hot pressed, but once it's got a coat of pastel on it, with water, then uh, it becomes fixed, and you can work over it with, with other pastels. So let's see what we can do with the use of these soft pastels and water, and working over the top. As I say, once you've used them with water, they're fixed, so it works on ordinary watercolour paper. And then we'll play around with the mediums a bit. I'm going to do one on Ungris paper for you in a sketch pad, a quick 10-minute uh, uh, sunset study, just to show you how quickly we can use that technique of blocking and blending just as the sun goes down here over the water, which is quite fun. And I'm also going to show you uh, later on the use of Indian ink and stick and the use of Indian ink and brush and water, the pastel over the Indian ink and also the Indian ink on the paper itself, which is very effective and we should use a little bit of washes as well. Possibly we'll link this film with one of the series of Painting in Dales and Fens later, but for the moment we'll make it this little standalone film um, of this lovely little week in, the, in spring, in April, here in the Dales. I think for our other composition, this spot here will be good. We take in all of this area. The first thing I do is to hold my hands up and make a frame, find my composition and then lightly mark out with a grey pastel. I'm using a 140 pound Archer's Hot Press watercolour paper, a nice smooth surface, which means that when I put pastel straight onto it and then brush water on, it's fixed. Those first coats once they're dry won't move and I can easily put pastel over the top. Lovely way to blend, almost like painting with the oil paints in a way you can move it around with your fingers even. Just remember that when you're painting like this, 
the pasta will appear darker when wet and will dry off lighter later. So although this looks quite dark, it won't be. You can add pastel into the wet pastel, as I'm doing here, and you can blend it in with your fingers or you can brush it in again, as you'll see me doing. It makes it a very versatile method because although we can use the pastels almost transparently with the water, and they are a, an opaque medium anyway, um, we can actually work pastel over wet pastel or pastel over the dry pastel afterwards in exactly the same way as you normally would with a pastel on pastel paper. I tend to normally work at my mid-tones first and then establish my darker and go lighter and lighter until I finally finish off with the highlights. As with the traditional method of blocking and blending with pastels, I paint in my main areas, block in my main areas first, and then gradually add the details as I go along, finishing up with both highlights and fine details. You can see by the way I'm working here how easy it is to put light over dark or dark over light, which is one of the great advantages of pastel. And you can also see how I'm just starting to struggle a bit with my lack of the darks, just the purple and the mid deep green. I could do with a deeper green, I could certainly do with a deeper blue, and at the end I could do with a little bit of the almost black. The undercoat of pastel that I put on earlier using water is not moving at all, and it's now easy to put new clean pastel over the top. One advantage I did find over using the SAA pastels is that they're slightly harder than the uh, Unisons and also slightly slimmer, although in fact they weigh more and are less in price, so we're getting very good value for money. It also means that I can do finer work, like the branches and twigs here, with the edge of the pastel more easily than I can the big chunky Unisons. I say we've done as much as we're going to do on that, just to show you what these SAE pastels will do with a bit of water. Um, it looks like it might rain now, so I'm going to stop. And uh, I could do with a very, very dark blue yet. Um, this is what I want, the dark, darker, cooler colours in it, just to bring it out. But uh, it shows the need for the darker range, I think.
Continuing our theme of using pastel over watercolour paper, as you remember it was £140 Arches Hot Press, the smooth surface paper, let's do this scene of the daffodils where we can show how darker colours and mid-tones can be laid in first with water, which are fixed, and then how we can lay the lighter and brighter colours on top, which is something you can't do with watercolour of course. I prefer to lay the colours onto the dry paper and then work water into them. Then I can work further colours in afterwards, having to judge just how light they're going to dry afterwards. I mean, at the moment that looks very dark, but it will dry lighter later. And of course, whilst it's wet, you can move it around with your fingers, almost like you can oil paint. It's quite uh, liquid. But once it's dry, that's it, it's fixed. And then we can lay lighter colours over the top that we can see quite easily. In fact, once those first colours are dry, we can treat it just like an ordinary pastel and block and blend, just as we would, feathering and scumbling and so on. And as you see here with the trunk of the tree, you can work backwards and forwards whenever you want. You can put the water on whenever you like, and you can just let it dry and work the pastel over the top. You can then go back in with the water later to do details if you wish as well. For instance, this tree here, um, I put it with dark pastel and worked up with the water, but I could then drag out those marks with water to get very fine marks if I wanted, rather than trying to do it with the edge of the pastel. You can even use a fine brush with some water on to take pastel off from the pastel stick itself and add that to the painting, painting it with the brush tip. So a fine brush can be used even like a rigger. I was talking to a student recently who was in America and we were emailing each other backwards and forwards. He's had a few of my DVDs. And we were talking about the fact that normally the recession of colour, the aerial perspective, means that colours are warmer in the foreground and cooler in the background. I have to be very aware of this even with my greens. The greens need to be warmer in the foreground and cooler in the background, unless of course a sunset or a sunrise where things differ. Here you can see more clearly the texturing I've done with the water on the brush. To use it just like watercolour, to use the brush into the pastel and make little strokes and marks to get the texture of the grasses and the leaves of the daffodils. So what are we using in our armoury? We're using light and dark, we're using warm and cool, and we're using texture, rough and smooth. It's very important with the greens that you are very aware of the blues and warmer greens as well, the browner greens and the cooler greens. So we've got turquoises and then we've got the much warmer, richer orangey greens to use. Here I'm showing you how to do the narcissi, demonstrating the petals. And even with the yellows there are warm and cools. The much lighter lemon yellow for the outer petals is much cooler than the much warmer cadmium and then the oranges at the centre of the flower. Really do look for your colours and warms and cools, especially if you're an impressionist like me, where the colour is absolutely vital. The petals towards the back of this block of flowers I was using very light blues and even light greens in to give the effect of distance and the way the light shines through their transparent leaves. So I hope you're beginning to see how the use of water with the pastels and the use of brushes gives you much more chance of texture and also with the leaves here we can build up that texture with the water at first and then afterwards build up over the top with more layers of dry pastel and even use the brush again to give more texture in the leaves. During this film I'm also going to show you a few pieces of my past artwork that I feel are relevant to the scenes that you are seeing. Some of these are done nearly 40 years ago, like this one. This work was an ordinary drawing pencil tinted with coloured pencils and this one a watercolour. Now for one of the fastest approaches that I know, the old English method of blocking and blending. I've shown you this before in some of my pastels that we've done as sunsets up in Scotland over Loch Lomond. It's very rapid and I shall produce this picture in only 10 minutes flat. It's also possible to travel very light this way. You see I've got my little kneesel, a three-legged stool and the pastel pad and then just the pastels and that's it, that's all I require. 
Now I'm going to demonstrate the old English traditional method of pastel. Here we take an ongress pastel pad, ongress paper, and make sure you get the right side of the paper, not the orange peel side, just the ordinary smooth but textured side. It has plenty of bite on it. And we block the shapes in and blend them. When I've covered most of the paper, I start to work on the surface again. Pastel works by reflected light on the little molecules, the particles, the pigment of the pastel. If they're smudged, they're dull. So our last coats want to be nice and fresh and untouched. Let me show you it at high speed, 10 minutes only, right the way through the whole thing.
One of the nice things about the Dales in this particular area is that all of the pubs are dog friendly. I don't know why more pubs in this country can't do this. Dogs are no problem if they're well behaved and well trained, and most people like to pet them and be very friendly with them and even offer them the odd chip. I wanted to attempt this very difficult view and complicated view of a Burnsell Bridge before I left, although I managed to do another one later with a bit more time and much better conditions. This early morning it was a hell of a wind, very cold and very very difficult to work indeed and I was having to balance the board on top of a wall um, from the edge of the road looking over the view. Of course it was raining a bit in between and it was very difficult to even hold the board down. But let me show you how it works and how I use the same method of again water and pastel at first and then built up over to give a rapid impression of study of this scene early morning. You can see how strong the wind was by the way my hair is blowing and my jersey and even the camera was rocking. I was afraid the camera might get blown over. But it's so nice to work out of doors on plein air. I think you gain so much more. If you want to do a very commercial uh, fine art work then working for photographs in the studio is obviously the best way. But if you want to get that vigorous approach of liveliness and learn more about colour and light and have the challenge of the light constantly changing in these conditions, and it is a challenge, and if you succeed, it's a wonderful feeling. It's just lovely to be out there, and I, I, I really do advise it, not just in sketch pads, but actually using boards like this and getting out there to produce whole works. I usually start from the horizon and I nearly always start with my mid-tones and then work through to the darks. It is very useful when painting a picture like this where the light's constantly changing we've got these highlights across the hills. It means that if you finish with your light colours you can put the highlights of sunset across whenever you like when they're crossing to get in the right position and the right composition as you wish. And then just finish with a few darker tones and the very lightest highlights at the end. Another useful thing about this area also is the network of roads and with my mobility problems as many of you have I can reach nearly all of these spots as you can see by these tracks or network of roads and don't have to go far from the car to be able to paint where I can just sit down on my deck chair and so on and make it comfortable and manage. Since my return from France and before I used to visit this area quite a lot and I love autumn colours there and the summer as well but in this case this is my first time in spring so with all these young lambs, flowers coming out and nesting birds.
Later on, I'm going to show you a whole series of photographs that I took of the trees alongside the river. All of these would be ideal for the techniques I'm about to show you. We're going to use black ink with a stick and with brushes to do drawings. Now, this is very, very effective, and you can use it on newsprint or on watercolour paper, and you can even work the pastels over. You can use the black Indian ink also on actual pastel paper and paint it on. You can stretch pastel paper in just the same way as you can watercolour paper if you wish to. Here's the black Indian ink now I'm showing you. You see in my hand a piece of dowel rod that's been cut and sharpened. Black Indian ink is waterproof, of course, when it's dry. You can also just cut a piece of stick from the branches on, on the hedge next to you, as long as it's not got a central core or pith. And the stick is a great thing to draw with. It'll give you a nice line for branches and twigs, just as nice as a, a pen. And of course the brush is very versatile as well. I mean, we've seen how well the Chinese and Japanese work with just brushes. And then of course you can lay pastel over the Indian ink later if you want to as well, or you can just keep it as an Indian ink drawing as I'm going to show you later, and use um, the washes of the ink and water just to give a tonal effect if you wish. I've also used a sponge for texture in the second one. In this case I'm just using the sharpened piece of stick or dowel rod to do my drawing. It's a much nicer mark than a pen and more versatile. And then you can add to this with a brush if you want to as well. Great for doing these fine twigs. And of course you could use the same technique and give it washes of either acrylic ink or watercolour. You could use this as a pen and ink technique with watercolour. I always advise using the pen first with watercolour anyway, and not the watercolour and then the pen afterwards, as people tend to overwork the pen and make it look like a chicken's been scratching about. Now at this stage we could leave it as a black and white, but I'm going to take it further with the tonal work of thinning down washes, and then I'm going to start adding the pastel on and using water as well with that to link and blend it in, or just work the pastel straight across neatly if you wish, because the watercolour paper is versatile enough for you to do any of that. Of course, if you wished, you could work the other way around and start putting more black ink now with the brush and add it on top. And so with my usual loose approach, if we start loose we can finish tight. We can finish as tight as we want. If we start loose we can gradually build up our detail and call it completed when we wish we're in control. But if you start tight you can't finish loose.
So let's use this method again, this time using the stick and Indian ink and the brush and Indian ink. And we'll just do a tonal and linear work this time, a textural work. We'll use the stick and we'll use a brush and we'll use a bit of sponge in between as well, but no colour at the end at all. The Chinograph pencil is another good medium for this. I've shown it to you before, especially in snow scenes, because you can use the waxy, waterproof Chinograph pencil to do your first details, all your darks, the branches and twigs and things, and the watercolour afterwards, and then even pastel to finish off with the snow scenes. But Here you can see how I'm building up this painting, mainly tonally at first, with washes of the ink. I have actually mapped out the basic drawing with a piece of stick so I know where the branches and twigs are going and I'll gradually build up these tones from lighter to darker finishing off with the final coats of just pure Indian ink at the end for my very darks. So really it's very similar to a watercolour technique except that we're not using colour, just tone. Now let's speed the picture up so we can see the whole thing uh, at a quicker rate. So drawing is not just with thin line, it's not just with a pen, it's not just with a pencil. It can be with a brush as well, it can be with tones and it can be with texture. And talking of texture, let's take some sea sponge now and use it to make some of the texture for the fine pebbles. Remember, art shops sell sea sponges, but if you go to a sea sh uh, shell shop, then you'll often find bags of sponges there far cheaper, and you might get a greater variety as well. You need to look at different sponges for different textures, obviously.
It's been many years since I've been to Aysgarth Falls, and that absolutely beautiful place it is as well. Not just the falls themselves, but the trip to get there, to all this wonderful countryside. And when you get there, the actual woodland and the spring flowers were beautiful. But another thing was Aysgarth Church. I don't remember Aysgarth Church at all, but at this time of year, with all the yellow celandines and daffodils, it was absolutely incredible. And I would certainly advise that you go there. On the way, this oyster catcher very obligingly sat on top of a wall right next to the road so I could photograph it to the window. We stopped for a brief break, let the dogs out, and two red grouse got up just in front of my feet, so I was able to get photographs of those unusual birds. Parking is available just above the church here at only £3 for the whole day. There's also parking just above the falls, so access is fairly easy even for wheelchairs and those who can't walk so well. Not only was this one of the most incredible and beautiful churchyards from the outside that I've ever seen, but also the inside and the wonderful rood screen, the beautiful decoration of the church, was well worth seeing. Although you couldn't get wheelchair access to all of the vantage points, it was still possible to see enough.
And if you are a real ale drinker and enjoy that real beer taste, then you need to visit the uh, brewery at Masham, Theakston's, the old Peculiar, and the other beers, various beers that they have, wonderful. Not expensive, and they take you right around the whole factory if you want to see. When I was being shown around, there were also other visitors with special needs. Two of them had both sight problems and learning difficulties, but they were well catered for and enjoyed the trip and the visit all the same. Space in the middle, so usually about you're waiting for a chip, are you? Mm -hmm. There you go. As you've seen by some of the paintings from my past here, there are places I'd like to go back and visit and see again. They haven't changed much in all of these years, and it's nice to do new artwork there, see why I may have changed my own style or differed. It's also nice to visit these old haunts. Here are three paintings from over 30 years ago, a watercolour and two oil paintings on MDF. Now that the weather's improved, let's go back late afternoon and try another pastel over Burnsell Bridge. Here I found a nice spot a little way down a footpath that I can reach easily and has a public park bench I can sit on. Well as you can see a complete climate change the other morning and I was just above here in that howling gale and horrible weather. Now I've got a, a last sunny afternoon before I go back last sheet of paper so I thought I'd just do a last watercolour and uh, a last water and pastel. Uh, within this film we've also seen all the diversity of this side of the countryside now, different dales and fields and uh, there's this beautiful scenery that's around here. I hope you've enjoyed an, another film outdoors with me once again. The first thing is to try and get the uh, composition in. I've got the church just about here. 
to the same technique as before on a horrible blustery morning. This time I've got a bit more time. So I've worked up my mid-tones and dark tones. And then as the light changes, I'm able to bring the lighter colours shimmering over the top to get the effect of sunlight. I'm going to mix the colours together on the paper first this time. I went up into a place in the hills where I did a watercolour last autumn and rather enjoyed this beautiful view. Don't try to be exact. We're not copying a photograph, but make your marks about what you're doing. Use the atmosphere, the impression, the impression especially in this case. Make the stick marks, the brush marks about those branches, the way that they twist and bind, the way that they turn and angle. Um, don't try and be exact. It's quite fun to use a medium tone paper or background and do the dark lines in the dark ink and then work up with a lighter paint or acrylic or, or lighter ink afterwards. 
You can take a look at some of my previous films where I show this, especially with birch trees, wonderful trees to use for this method. Yes, sketch pads are much more personal and take you into the mediums and the methods as well, but for most of us a camera is the easiest pathway and I carry one nearly constantly with me as you can see, so I can use the photographs not only for my students but for myself whenever I want to have constant resource and reference material. This was a large pastel done with unison pastels and then there's a watercolour wet in wet of those woodland scenes with the light shining through. Good pitch! Pitch it! Good dog! Good girl! Good dog! Pitch it here! Good girl! Good dog! Good girl! Come here! Good dog! Oh, that's a good girl! Yes! That's a good doggies! You can fish it! Good dog! Yes! I can no longer walk the long distances myself, but I can keep the dock occupied by keeping her retrieving as much as possible. Throwing a ball with a throwing stick and so on makes her run 20 times the distances that I have to ever move. And she loves it. And it gives me a good companion too. Good girl! Come on! There we go! Yes! Come here! Drop. Good dog. Sit down. Good girl. Stay there. Good fetch. Dog. Good girl. Come on. Well that brings me to the end of this short film, sharing another painting holiday with you. I do hope you've enjoyed it, and you'll enjoy sharing the next one with me as well.